Hello everyone and welcome back to lecture. We are kicking off this week, week two, with minerals. So minerals are the building blocks of both rocks and sediment. All rocks are made up of at least two minerals or more, usually more, and many different minerals can be found in sediment. Um, minerals are particularly important to us because we've been using them since uh, since essentially the beginning of modern Homo sapiens. Uh, with particular attention to bronze for jewelry and adornments and iron for tools. We also used minerals uh, commonly in construction and pottery or ceramics, which are still all used today in addition to uh, minerals for electronics, so anything conductive, copper, nickel, iron, anything like that, medical and dental, aeronautical, uh, many airplanes are made out of aluminum because it is a lightweight metal and it's durable but uh, it also doesn't weigh a whole lot. Nutrition and everything else um, because everything that humans have is either mined or grown. So this is a figure that I like to show. This is based on the average American and on whole, uh, we will each consume 3.19 million pounds of minerals, uh, metals and fuels over our lifetime. That includes about 11,000 pounds of clay, 21,000 pounds of iron, 30,000 pounds of salt, uh, 75,000 gallons of gas or petroleum, and the list goes on. There are approximately 5,400 different minerals. Um, this number is probably closer to 6,000 now. I grabbed that maybe a year ago. Um, but that's because dozens of new minerals are discovered every year. Of those 5,400, uh, about 200 of those are considered common, and of those, 50 of them are considered essential, which are many of those that we just went over in the last figure. So I have one example here of a new mineral as of 2020, and this is petrobite, which is a mineral made of oxygen, sodium, and copper. It's just a, a new exotic mineral that they found uh, in a volcano in Russia. So this happens fairly often. It's quite common, and that's because there can be a lot of simple uh, variations on any chemical formula. If you think about the periodic table, there are a lot of elements, so there are a lot of different arrangements that we can have. So it is very unlikely that we have found all minerals that exist or that all minerals have come into existence yet. We can categorize minerals by their use. So one common one is construction. Uh, some of you have probably worked with drywall before. The common component in that is gypsum. So that would be one example of construction material mineral. Uh, and those are defined by their need for minimal processing. The gypsum that's used in drywall is essentially just ground up and added with a couple of other additives, but that's pretty much it. It's just grinding it up into a fine powder. And then we have gems, which are generally the lab-created uh, stones used in jewelry. These are the ones that we're familiar with. Uh, diamond, opal, sapphires. There are natural diamonds, opals, and sapphires, but gems are generally the ones that are made in the lab, so that's what separates gems from precious stones. And then we have ore minerals, so anything that is mined and processed uh, for its specific parts and pieces, such as phosphate for fertilizers, salt for road salt, or salt for even your table salt, uh, or fluorite in your water. Many years ago, I had a roommate who, uh, anytime there was a lull in conversation or uh, needed to strike up a convo in the elevator to get rid of silence, he would ask somebody, is cereal a soup? Uh, he did this so much so that it ended up being what we put on his uh, birthday cake, not that that's important, uh, but I want to ask you guys this question, is cereal a soup? And well, maybe, it depends on how we define soup, right? So if soup, say, is something that is uh, a liquid with solid chunks in it, well, cereal meets that criteria. What if we say that soup has to be made with a broth? Well, then what is a broth? Is a broth simply a liquid that has absorbed 
flavor from anything that's been put in it, then yeah, cereal probably meets that criteria. That's why um, you put chocolate cereal in milk, then 10 minutes later you have chocolate milk in the bowl. What if we say, well, no soup has to be warm? Well, does it? A gazpacho is a really common cold soup. There are several other cold soups as well. What if we say, no cereal is dairy and soup is water? Then what about chowders? So the list goes on and you can really develop this. This argument can go on forever, which is why my friend liked it so much. Um, anyways, what does this have to do with minerals? Well, it, like I said, it comes down to what we define a soup as, but what do we define a mineral as? And that is, number one, it has to be naturally occurring. So anything generated in a lab, not a mineral. Uh, that would actually be a mineraloid, which we'll come back to momentarily. Has to be inorganic, which means it's formed by geological processes, not biological processes. Homogeneous, meaning it only consists of itself, it doesn't have any other minerals in it, because if it had other minerals in it, more than one mineral, then it's a rock, not a mineral. Has to be a pure substance, it's kind of an elaboration on it has to be homogeneous. Made of elements or compounds, what else is it going to be made out of? Characterized by a well-defined composition. So this is probably one of the most uh, important definitions of a mineral. So uh, this just means that we need to be able to formulate it. In other words, we can take it and break it down through geochemical analysis and find the exact same ratio of elements in it every single time. Needs to be comprised of an ordered, repeating arrangement of atoms that form a crystalline solid. This simply means that the atoms within this mineral will form a specific pattern that will repeat itself to build the structure of the mineral. And there are uh, several weird exceptions to this rule, which is where we get mineraloids, as mentioned earlier, which is something that meets most, but not necessarily all of the criteria, and we'll go over a few examples of that. But this brings me to uh, another question, like, is cereal a soup? Is ice a mineral? And this is something that geologists have debated for a long time, so I want to hear from you guys. This is going to be a question on your quiz. Is ice a mineral? What do you think uh, it meets in terms of the criteria for a mineral. Does it meet all of them? Is ice a mineral? Is it not a mineral? If it is, why is it? If it's not, why isn't it? So mineraloids are things that are not minerals but uh, are almost minerals. So these are, again, things that meet most but not all of the criteria for minerals. So perhaps you might argue that ice is a mineraloid if you didn't argue that it was a mineral. Perhaps you might argue that it's neither. Some examples of mineraloids include pearl, opal, and amber. If you think about what those are, pearl and opal and amber, all of these are organic in origin. So amber is tree sap, opal is a microcrystalline quartz, and pearl is produced within a living organism, right? Uh, and as we saw in the previous slide, one of the criteria for minerals uh, is that it has to be inorganic. And then synthetic minerals, anything made in a lab, commonly called gems, also not minerals. They are mineraloids. Anthropogenic minerals, these are byproducts of human activity. So some of you, especially in Michigan along the beach shoreline, you might find what's called slag. Um, it's usually a sharp, jagged rock that is somewhat clear and can range uh, in a lot of different colors. This is a byproduct of a lot of industrial processes, which gives it its wide range of colors. But essentially, it is a uh, waste mineral made by human processes. Uh, they'll usually have a bunch of holes in them and are somewhat transparent as well. Biominerals, anything, again, produced biologically, not a mineral, but it meets a lot of the criteria, so it is a mineraloid. One example of this is teeth. Um, my sister-in-law uh, hates teeth, is very creeped out by them, does not like to see people smile, and this is because, in her mind, these are face bones, or the only bones in your body that stick out of your body. She doesn't like seeing people's bones, uh, which makes some sense, right? Nobody wants to see other people's bones, but uh, our teeth are somewhat considered bones. 
and she did not uh, take solace in the fact that teeth are actually appetites. So uh, when you think about teeth and bones, they have different hardnesses. Your teeth are more prone to decay, not only because they're in direct contact with a lot of things, but because they have a different hardness, and that's because they're not really bone. They are rather appetite, which is a mineral, mineraloid. And then shells, which are technically aragonite or calcite, they're mostly formed by silica. And then bacterial deposits, um, there's a lot of different ways that dead bacteria can stack to make something that, that turns into a mineraloid. And then we have things that are definitely not minerals. So again, rocks, not minerals, contain minerals, but not minerals in and of themselves. Sediment can contain minerals not a mineral. And then glass. So glass cannot have an ordered internal structure. Glass uh, and all glass means that it is amorphous. So every atom is frozen in time, meaning that there is not enough cooling or pressure time for the atoms to link up and make an arrangement or make an ordered structure. They're all sort of just uh, sporadically placed within the glass itself. And here we have a picture of what happens in a quartz-rich sand. If there is a metal probe within it and lightning strikes that metal probe, there is some um, romantic comedy movie that's based around a guy making a business off of this, and I'm completely blanking on the name. I'll have to try and remember that and post it somewhere. Um, but these can be really beautiful and large. They can turn into to really beautiful sculptures and be sold. Um, but they are not minerals. They are glass. They're not rocks. They are glass. So elements make up minerals. And minerals are the building blocks of rocks. Rocks are made up of one or more minerals. They can be made up of minerals and mineraloids and or organic compounds as well. So rocks can really be any kind of earth material smashed together into a substance. Uh, whereas minerals are just minerals, they're made up of elements. And those elements come in the form of singular atoms. So to help us sort of wrap our mind around this, uh, mind you the radius of the earth is around 6,370 kilometers. And the radius of a basketball, about 12 centimeters. A radius of your average grain of sand, one millimeter. And the radius of a single atom is 10 to the negative seventh millimeters. So that is 0 0.0000001 millimeters. It is just barely visible with the human eye. To the right here is a photo of a singular atom. Um, this is from 2020, so this is somewhat recent. We were not actually able to see atoms directly until this century. We were able to produce uh, photos of them based on res electrical responses prior to this, starting in, I think it was about the 1960s. Um, but we did not see an atom with our bare eye until very recently. And personally, I still can't see it in this photo. You're supposed to be able to, but uh, I hope you guys can. I know that I need a new prescription, but maybe maybe you guys can see it. Another, and anyways, they're very, very small, and these are the building blocks of minerals. So an element is uh, your basic indivisible substance of matter. We can't break it down any further than that. That's as small as it gets. And an atom is the smallest particle of an element. So we can have several atoms of a singular element. So that's uh, as small as that gets. And to clarify this, an, you can have several atoms of different elements that stack together, but an atom itself is only going to be one element. An atom is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Uh, this is structured in a way that the nucleus of the atom contains both neutrons and protons. So neutrons have a neutral charge and protons have a positive charge and those are housed in the nucleus or the center of an atom. And then going around that center of the atom are orbital shells or spinning electrons. And these electrons have negative charges. 
Uh, an atom in and of itself will have a neutral charge, which means that the amount of positive charge needs to equal the amount of negative charge. So if we have, say, four protons in the nucleus of an atom, there will be four electrons orbiting around that nucleus as well, because we need the same amount of ch negative charge as we do positive charge for there to be a neutral charge. Doesn't matter how many neutrons there are because those are neutrally charged. So you can think of this sort of like the solar system. Uh, we have the nucleus, which would be analogous to the sun, and then orbital shells, which would be analogous to the paths of the planets uh, revolving around the sun. And just like we said in the previous slide, if you have six neutrons, you also need six electrons to counter that balance. And the number of protons is the atomic number. And if you change the number of protons, you change the element. So if you change the atomic number, you also change the element because the atomic number is simply the number of protons. Let's take uh, iron, for example, notated as Fe in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 26. That is, same as, that is the same as the number of protons, so iron has 26 protons per atom. However, if we change the number of protons to 27, we are no longer iron, we are now cobalt. And 27 is the atomic number for cobalt, keeping it simple. Now, ions are atoms, however, they are atoms with either uh, a positive charge, an overall positive charge, which would be called a cation, or an overall negative charge, referred to as an anion. So this can be confusing, but both anions and cations are types of atoms. They are called ions, meaning that they are just atoms that do not have a neutral charge. And cation specifically, again, positively charged ion, and anion is a negatively charged ion. This imbalance of charges is uh, what allows us to be able to build anything, or not necessarily us, but nature, to build anything. Lattices of atoms are held together in place by atomic bond, bonds, uh, which are built off of this imbalance in charge. And this is because nature generally will uh, lean towards a neutral charge or balance. Nature likes to be in balance. You guys have probably heard of the term homeostasis, uh, that your body will try to return to homeostasis, meaning uh, its regular set of temperature, um, its regular flow in and out of the heart. Uh, and all these other things that can go into it. So nature likes to be balanced, which means that we need to have positive and negatively charged anions or cations uh, and anions uh, to couple together to build lattices, which gives any material its structure. And this occurs by five primary types of bonds, ionic, covalent, metallic, van der Waals, and hydrogen bonds. There are two main types of bonds that I want you guys to be familiar with, and that's because these are the two most common bonds in minerals. Uh, one being ionic, that is the overwhelming majority of bonding that happens in minerals. Uh, and this is just simply an electronic uh, charge attraction. So uh, you can consider them as sort of magnets that are holding each other together in space. So one example is NaCl, or table salt, uh, or halite, the mineral. So uh, Na, uh, sodium, would have a positive charge, while chloride, or Cl, has a negative charge. And if they are close enough, they can just hold each other together in space by attracting each other with those charges. Uh, creating an overall net neutral charge if they stay in those positions. Covalent, similarly and dissimilarly, uh, attains a neutral charge, however, but instead of being near each other and holding to, uh, each other together in space, they will share physically 
electrons, at least one or more, uh, in their uh, orbiting shells to cr create an overall neutral charge. And this is uh, common in gases, but relatively rare in minerals. The importance of different types of bonding and structuring uh, in the atomic structure of different minerals can further be uh, emphasized by the existence of polymorphs. And polymorphs are any uh, minerals or crystals that have the same composition uh, but different structure. A really common example of this is diamonds and graphite. You guys are familiar with diamonds and graphite being uh, the makeup of your average pencil. Now, uh, both diamonds and graphite are, have the same exact composition, which is carbon. Uh, however, diamonds uh, are bonded by tetrahedral configurations, and that is a, essentially just a singular atom with four uh, atoms attached to it, forming a, a, essentially a pyramid. And these are really strong bonds. So this is what gives us the idea that diamonds are forever, uh, which they're not. They're formed at a very high pressure. So uh, if they stay at a lower pressure, such as Earth's surface, uh, for long enough, they will uh, eventually fall apart. This takes quite a bit longer than the average human's lifespan, though. So uh, they can be considered forever in terms of our lifespan. On the other hand, graphite is held together by van der Waals, which is a very weak type of bond. It's just a, a, a weaker form of an ionic bond where it's a, a loose attraction uh, held in space. And so this is formed sheets in graphite, which allows it to break or flake off and leave markings on your paper. When there is diamonds, you can see that this is a, a much stronger supported structure. You all may have heard that uh, triangles and hexagons are the strongest shapes in nature. And that's because one, they have the unique ability to tessellate so they can cover uh, any shaped object by uh, being in contact with one another. And the way that they displace weight or energy uh, at the certain angles that they have allows them to displace it in a way that it is evenly spread out and it's not too uh, heavy on any which uh, component uh, or apex connection. So you can see the hexagon outlined here and the diamond. We still have this in graphite. However, it's very strong in one direction, meaning this direction, it would be much harder to break or cut. But if we go in this direction along its plane of weakness, it is very easy to cut or break. So this is a, a good point in time to take a little brain break. So I'm gonna give it a few seconds if you would like to pause before continuing. So getting into actual identification of minerals. You guys have had a little taste of this already in your minerals lab. So a lot of this is going to be review. Uh, but when we talk about mineral identification, generally the first thing that pops out at us is color. And color is organized within geologic terms from light in coloration to dark in coloration. And along that spectrum, those that are dark in coloration are referred to as mafic. These are minerals that are high in magnesium, iron, calcium. These are heavy elements. Then we have intermediate, somewhere in between, and felsic, those that are a light in coloration. These are minerals that have uh, a lot of silica, potassium, calcium, sodium. These are relatively light elements. And what we see as we increase or uh, increase the darkness in color as we are also increasing the specific gravity, uh, which is essentially the inverse of density, meaning that it, it feels heavier in your hand given the relative size of the sample, uh, the darker that it is. And that makes sense because uh, if you pick up something that is made up entirely of, say, sodium, salt, 
uh, versus something that is made up entirely of iron, but they're the same sizes in both of your hands, which one's going to feel heavier? It's the iron. So the iron would have a higher specific gravity. The iron is also going to be much darker in coloration. It's going to be a dark gray, whether it's sodium is nearly white. However, the thing with color is that it can't always be a very specific identifier for us, and that's because there are an awful lot of clear minerals, an awful lot of gray minerals, and so on and so forth. Some colors can be more helpful in identification than others, uh, but one good example of where color can be tricky is sapphire and ruby. So these are two uh, crystals that are actually the same crystal. If any of you are familiar with the show Steven Universe, uh, the premise is that every character is a personified precious gem, and they can fuse together to create more powerful uh, gems or people with more powers. And so in this show they have both a character named Sapphire and a character named Ruby, and these two characters combine to form a character called Garnet. and. Uh, this is incorrect because, geologically, because ruby and sapphire are the same mineral, so they technically could combine to, to make uh, a purple version of that mineral, and that mineral is corundum. However, in the show, they call it garnet. I think because it's catchier. I love this character, uh, but if I'm on my geologist soapbox, it shouldn't be called garnet. It should be called corundum. So moving on, uh, one of the most helpful or useful identification properties we have for mineral is hardness. And this is simply a way for us to grade how hard a mineral is on a scale from 1 to 10. Now that specific scale is called Mohs Scale of Hardness. And we have different gauges or tools that we can use to, to tell us the hard, relative hardness of a mineral. Um, in your mineral and rock identification kit, you'll find items such as a penny, a glass plate, and a steel nail. And these all correspond to different hardness levels. So we have some mineral examples, talc being a very soft mineral at a hardness of 1, diamond being the hardness mineral at a hardness of 10. Notice there's corundum again at a hardness of 9. It's a very hard mineral. and your fingernail will have about a hardness of 2.5. So if you can scratch a mineral sample with your fingernail, that means that its hardness is less than 2.5 because you can scratch it with your fingernail. And then uh, you can use the coin to perform the same task. If you can scratch it with the copper penny, then that means that it has a hardness less than 3.5. And then we jump to the glass, the glass plate, and there's two ways to verify this. Either you can scratch the glass plate with your rock sample. And if your rock sample leaves a scratch in the glass plate, that means that the rock is harder than the glass plate. And you can use it the opposite way, where you can use the corner of the glass plate to scratch the mineral itself. And if the glass plate scratches the mineral, that means that the glass plate is harder than the mineral. So there's two ways to check this, and there's two ways that are useful, and that's because uh, you may be using either a rounded mineral, which even if it is harder than the glass, it may not scratch it just because it's not jagged enough to do so. It's too well rounded, uh, which would be a case where you should use the corner of the glass to scratch the mineral to test the hardness, or if you're just trying to verify it to make sure that you're seeing what you're seeing, because sometimes uh, if it, it can be a difference between what if you're pressing really hard or too soft or anything like that. So it's good to use both ways to check hardness with the glass plate. This idea continues with the steel nail at a hardness of 6.5. Luster is yet another descriptor of minerals. So this is a mineral property as well. And generally, we will categorize luster into metallic or non-metallic. Uh, metallic, easy to identify, looks like a metal. So something 
like this would be metallic. If it's anything else, it's not metallic. Now, non-metallic can break down into a lot of different categories within itself. From here, we can get something that's pearly or earthy and dull, adamantine, a lot of internal shine or sparkle, glassy, so on and so forth. And there's a little bit of room for interpretation in this identifier because what you might say is earthy, I might say is dull, or what you might say is pearly, I might say is waxy, or any of these other things. The sample could also be greasy, um, or anything that you can find to describe the texture or the look at, of it in addition to color. Streak. Uh, in your testing kit, you'll find both a white streak plate and a black streak plate. And this is because a uh, white streak will not appear on the white streak plate. If you scratch a mineral on the white streak plate and don't see anything, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's no streak or that it's harder than the streak plate. It might mean that the streak is white, which is why you want to test it on both. If you streak it on the black plate and still nothing shows up, that means the mineral is harder than the streak plate and it leaves no streak. But if you were to scratch it on the black streak plate and see the, the streak, or perhaps a white streak, then you have your answer. Now the thing about streak is that um, a mineral may leave a streak that is a different color from itself. So if we look at some of these, for example, we see uh, a bunch of different gray rocks that look almost the same to an untrained eye. And we can see that this gray rock leaves a gray streak. This gray rock leaves a gray streak. That's probably what you would expect. However, these two on the opposite corners leave more of a red to brown streak. And this can be very key in identifying a mineral. Here's another one where it's a pink and gray, but it leaves a very clear white streak. This sample is pyrite. This is gold in coloration, but it leaves a clear black streak. So this is just another way to play the game of process of elimination in determining what mineral you have in front of you. Cleavage is probably the most difficult uh, identifying property for people who are starting out in identifying minerals. And this can be hard to identify because not all samples are perfect. You won't be able to see cleavage in all samples. And, uh, some cases, all you can write down for cleavage is that it has poor cleavage. And cleavage is simply how a mineral is inclined to break. Take uh, table salt, for example. Table salt is the mineral halite. And table salt, no matter how small pieces you break it into, is inclined to break into cubic pieces because it has cubic cleavage. If you look up a uh, table saw under a microscope, you will see that they are all cubic pieces in nature, and that's because no matter how much we break it, it will always break into cubic shapes because its atomic structuring is shaped in that way. So if we keep breaking it down until we break it down into individual uh, atoms, it's going to be cubic. And so one prime example of this is mica muscovite which is a thin sheet-like mineral, which are laid up on top of each other like so, and you can often just break them off and peel it off in sheets. When we have large hunks or chunks of uh, mica muscovite, we call it books because it's made up of sheets. And that's something that has one plane of cleavage. That would be this example right here. You can see the sheets stacked up on top of each other. So this would represent its plane of weakness or the plane that it's likely to break along. If you imagine this uh, sheet sort of sliding right in between the sheets here, those are the planes that it's likely to break upon because we can peel it off like sheets. And that one, usually people are okay with understanding. If we consider something like this example, we have one cleavage plane here and a second cleavage plane here. And then on the back side of this, the, the flat back side, that would be the second cleavage plane as well. And the bottom that this is resting on is the first cleavage plane. And that's because they're parallel to each other. So if we take something that is a rectangular prism, like the example that we're looking at here, we will find that it has six sides. One, 
back two, side three, four, top, bottom, five, six, right? And every parallel side is going to be one plane. So this was one plane because they're parallel to each other. This is another plane parallel to each other. And this is another plane parallel to each other because they're all heading in the same direction. That's how they're grouped by. So this would have three directions of cleavage and because it's square at approximately 90 degree angles. So this is 90 degrees. This can happen at not 90 degrees, which is the example that we have for calcite in the bottom right here. And this is at something greater than 90 degrees, specifically here at 120 degrees. So when you guys come across cleavage, don't be afraid to ask questions because that's something that uh, can take a little while to register. Oftentimes it may be very difficult to distinguish between a fractured surface and a cleavage plane. And a good way to look and see if it's a cleavage plane or a fractured surface is to see if you see any internal repeating of that. So perhaps you might look at your sample and see what some people call little cliffs, uh, which would be repeats of that breakage, like in this example here, um, rather than this being like a straight rectangular prism, as this would suggest. It has several steps or cliffs that are all breaking in the same direction or same fashion. So you'll look for repeats of that. And that keys you in that that's its atomic structure and that's setting, it's up, setting it up that way. Similar to cleavage is crystal habit. Uh, for all intensive purposes, this can be regarded as essentially the same as cleavage. Uh, this is how a mineral grows. So this is a shape that it grows into rather than breaks down into. However, uh, in some cases we can have something that grows into this shape but will also break down into the same shape. Take something with uh, cubic cleavage like we talked about with salt earlier. It both grows into that shape as a crystal but will break down into that shape if it's broken up. And so we can have a very wide variety of crystal habits within these. It's simply, again, a recognizable, repeatable, ex uh, external shape that the crystal grows into. And this only happens when crystals form under ideal conditions. So each one of these crystal habits has a specific set of conditions referring to uh, temperature and pressure and length of time that it's under those conditions for this to be able to form. So uh, in some cases, say you might see this cubic formation with pyrite or fool's gold is a common name. And in other times you might, it, it's not going to look like that because it didn't meet the ideal conditions for that crystal habit to show. There are several other properties that we can use to identify minerals, and some of these are more helpful than others. For example, if it's magnetic, you have a magnet in your testing kit, by the way. If it's magnetic, there's a, a much shorter list of minerals that have that property. So that reduces your number of options significantly. We can also have samples that react with HCl or hydrochloric acid. We use uh, 0.1 molarity hydrochloric acid in this lab. You'll find a small bottle of that in your testing kit as well. And this is simply seeing if there is a reaction uh, within the mineral to hydrochloric acid or not. You're not doing any extensive chemistry in this. It's simply yes, there's a reaction or no, there's not a reaction. That reaction specifically being fizzing or bubbling up as you can see in this picture here. And all you need for that is one single drop of hydrochloric acid. And it usually helps to use the corner of your glass plate to scratch up a natural divot um, in that mineral sample until just a little bit of that sample is powderized because it's more likely to, to react with a powdered version of the sample. If you don't see any fizzing, there's no, re <clears throat> there's no reaction. If you do see fizzing, then yes, there's a reaction. Again, same thing as magnetic. Now you have a much uh, further reduced list of options for that what that mineral could be. There are a few other uh, properties that we can use. Smell, taste, we're not going to be sticking anything in our mouths in this class, but you may have some samples that have particular smells or odors to them. Uh, striations or lineations, in, in other words, 
uh, you'll see a repeating pattern of lines that are facing the same direction uh, along the sample, or double refraction. And double refraction is a uh, manipulation of light through the sample. So if you have something clear uh, or transparent, you can see if it double refracts by holding it over the text on your lab, uh, on the paper. And if it manipulates the text and you see two, uh, or you're seeing double, hence double refraction uh, of those letterings or words, and that means that it double refracts. So there's somewhat of a suggested procedure for this. Uh, number one, start with color. That's going to be the easiest way to separate and group things together and reduce your list off the bat. And then beyond that, it's whatever jumps out at you. And that might be hardness. That's a good one to break things down by. Um, but if, say, something has a very clear cubic structure, then that might be the first thing to go by. Or if you can smell the sample already, then that odor will be a good thing to go by. If it's magnetic, again, that reduces your list, so on and so forth. So uh, generally, when you're identifying these minerals, you want at least three legs to stand on. That's a good climbing rule. You want three points of contact. If you're ever climbing up a wall, you don't let go with both hands or both legs or one hand and one leg. You want to make sure that you have at least three limbs in contact with the climbing wall at all times before you move that fourth limb. And so three legs to stand on with this. If you've got three things in support on your identification table, then it's likely that that's the correct mineral that you're looking at. So uh, I'll give it another couple seconds here to pause for another quick break. And so you can do what you need to do before we get back into it. Now, not all mineral samples will be the same quality as the mineral samples that are included in the set that you'll be identifying. Uh, sometimes uh, there are minerals that even a trained geologist or petrographer, uh, that's someone who deals specifically with minerals, will not be able to identify just by looking at. So we actually have several tools that we can go by. These are generally geochemical analyses, sometimes geophysical analyses. Uh, that we can use with the right technology to identify a mineral and all this comes down to is breaking down the components of a mineral and figuring out what the ratio of those components or elements are which will tell us a formula and we can identify the mineral from there because every mineral has a identifiable and definable formula. So one of these methods is atomic absorption. And this is when we can take a sample and powderize it and put it into a processor, which will uh, excite the sample by bombarding it with a high degree of electromagnetic radiation. And then we see uh, what different levels of absorption of that radiation we're getting from the different components, because each element will respond to radiation differently. So if we can see that uh, some radiation, a lot of radiation is being absorbed on the front end. We can, we can pull out that one element and then some of it might take longer to absorb the radiation and some of it might reflect most of the radiation and only absorb a small portion of it. So we can get its radiation response signature and from there identify the different components or different elements that uh, comprise that sample. Then there's optical emission, which is uh, parallel to atomic absorption in that we are bombarding it with energy except instead of electromagnetic radiation it's an electrical current through specifically metallic or mostly metallic samples and then seeing what the resulting discharge plasma is so we can measure that output and again relate it to what components are within. Then we can use liquid and gas chromatography which is observation of different flow and absorption. Same idea, we're bombarding a sample with energy and seeing how it responds to that energy. Mass, spectrometry, mass spectrometry, this is measuring the mass to charge ratio of ions. So this is slightly more complicated, but essentially it's how much energy is emitted from different amounts of ions. Remember, those are the negatively or positively charged atoms uh, within a sample. 
We have x-ray fluorescence, also referred to as XRF, and this is same idea, uh, bombarding a sample with energy, and uh, this energy specifically in this case being x-rays, and this is to determine the content, so we can send x-rays towards a sample and then look at how much those x-rays will def diffract or how deeply they penetrate into the sample, and depending on those different levels of penetration, we will have different elements available. X-ray diffraction, or XRD, is very similar to XRF, but instead of for determining composition, it's for determining structure. So same idea, X-rays penetrating at different levels, except instead of getting a compositional signature, we will get a structural signature, which can then relate to composition. And those are just used differently depending on the quality of the sample itself. Generally, if it's a better quality sample, we'll use XRF, and then if it's a lower quality sample, meaning that there are a whole lot of different things mixed in it and it's going to be harder to identify any one substance, we'll use XRD. And again, all of these methods take advantage of the natural geochemistry of a material. This can be used for very specific identification. Um, other than just a sample being poor, we can look at uh, the accessory elements uh, to any one rock. So take calcium carbonate, for example. Calcium carbonate is a common constituent of limestone, and limestone is rock that forms in oceanic environments. So we can look at oceanic bedrock or limestone from many millions of years ago and look at the accessory elements or uh, impurities of that limestone to determine what the environment was like at that point in time or what the climate was like in that point in time because different accessory minerals will be produced by different climates. Uh, generally speaking, we'll have more organic material when it's warmer unless it's too warm and we'll have more silicate material uh, when it's colder. So the, the theme with all of these is that we are sending energy into a sample and then seeing how it responds. And those responses will vary depending on composition and structure. And so we can backwards calculate the formula for whatever that substance is based on those responses. XRF, XRD, and mass spectrometry are the most commonly used methods in geochemistry, and that's because uh, A, they're affordable, B, they're relatively quick, and C, uh, they're the most accurate options that we have. Most all minerals that are available to us on Earth's surface are silicate minerals. So this is just one a class of minerals, and silicates simply means that it's made of silica and oxygen. And uh, this means specifically one silicon atom and, one, and four oxygen atoms, and these will stack together to form a tetrahedron. If any of you play D&D, &D, you're probably familiar with this shape as pictured in the die uh, on this slide. It's, so it is a four-sided die with uh, everything stacking up into a pyramid. And these can, when we have multiple of these, we can stack them up into different formations, and all of those different formations or different structuring patterns will determine the overall structure of the silicate mineral. And this is the building basic building block of all silicate minerals, so the majority of all minerals that you will find are made up uh, in its simplest form, or simpler form, of these uh, silicate building blocks, or tetrahedrons. On the right here, you'll see a gradient, or a down arrow, from simple or least polymerized to complex and most polymerized. This means how, uh, to what degree it is bonded, or how complex it is. And so if we start at the top here, we have a single standalone tetrahedron this is as simple as it gets, the least polymerized, and there's no sharing of oxygen between the tetrahedra. Individual tetrahedra are linked together by uh, just electrostatic charges. And so one example mineral of this is olivine, and this is a relatively weak uh, configuration. 
From there, we can stack them together with one bond at each corner to form a ring. So this is a, a rings or a slightly more complex level of silica. And these are just all different ways that we can stack these together. So it becomes complex in different ways. This is referred to as a chain where they're in a single order. If we put two chains stacked on top of each other, it becomes double chain. And this is sort of like the ring, but uh, it rings connected together as well. So there's a couple different ways to look at it. If we keep stacking these double chains on top of each other, we get sheets like graphite. It would be one example that we looked at earlier where you saw these hexagons stacked on top of each other. Now those aren't silica tetrahedrons, those are carbons, but same structural idea. Uh, mica muscovite is an example of those silicas stacked in this way into sheets. Uh, remember that's the, the mineral that we talked about with cleavage where it has one direction of cleavage and we can peel it off into sheets. And then we have framework where these will share not just one, but two of their oxygen atoms with other tetrahedra. This is a very strong and complex formation, hence framework because it has a strong framework or foundation. Then we have non-silicates, which are everything that's not a silicate, so not made of those silica tetrahedrons, silica oxygen tetrahedrons. This includes oxides. Examples of this are magnetite, hematite, sulfides, galena pyrite, sulfates, halides, those are salts, carbonates, organic material, uh, and native elements like copper, carbon, and sulfur. So. This is just one example over here with pyrite in a cubic lattice formation, which is different from the tetrahedron, as you can see visually here, which form a cubic arrangement. So non-silicates encompasses a much wider variety, but is a much smaller portion of the available minerals on Earth's surface. And we may not realize it, but we use minerals each and every day it's what makes up everything around us, even in things that we may not necessarily think of as minerals. And it's important to keep in mind that all of these minerals have different availabilities and are technically all limited resources, uh, even the lab generated ones, because you need the materials to be able to produce them in a lab. And some minerals can be extremely helpful to us. One example would be uh, bismuth, which is in the, the left-hand picture here at the top. Very pretty mineral. It's also this, the primary component of Pepto-Bismol. If you guys flip over a Pepto-Bismol container and look at the ingredients, the number one there is going to be bismuth. And this soothes a, a number of gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, any conductive material is another one that's completely critical to our society on whole. It's the reason that you're able to watch this lecture in the first place and that I'm able to record it for you. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, some minerals can be quite harmful to health or property or harmful to, to human life in general. Uh, one example of this would be asbestos. This was uh, much more of a problem in the 1970s. Asbestos works wonders for the original purpose that it served, which was uh, an uh, anti-flammable purpose. And it is very resistant to fire, and it's very good at that, which is why they used it in building insulation and a lot of other construction products. However, uh, the catch is that the needle-like fibers of the asbestos mineral can get caught up in the lungs and uh, can be lethal at certain doses and with enough exposure cause uh, lung cancer. Uh, swelling clays are another example of a perhaps less concerning, but just uh, but damaging in another way. And swelling clays are something that we do deal with here in Michigan. Uh, a lot of our subsurface soil, be it that we are a glacial environment, is sand, clay, and gravel. If you go outside right now and dig a hole, that's probably what you're going to find, a lot of sand, clay, and gravel. If you live in a house with a well, a water well, guaranteed they drilled through sand, clay, and gravel to get to your water source. And the thing about the clays in the soil is that they are very absorbent to water. That's why we are able to make pottery out of clay. And we, you see artists dipping their hands in a bucket of water and using that to shape clay 
on a wheel when they're making ceramics. And that's because clay is fairly absorbent. And then when they bake it in the kiln, it evaporates the water and leaving just the hardened shell of the clay itself. Um, and it's no longer malleable. So when it rains uh, or there's groundwater passing through, all of these clay will absorb that water and it will swell and actually increase in volume like a sponge. Uh, and then that can shift around the foundation of buildings, which will result in cracking or house settling. And so this is something that affects different parts of the U.S. in different ways. Uh, so any place with these swelling clays, is, you're going to look around a lot of old buildings and see a ton of this cracking or settling. You might even see that on the inside of your house if you're in an older home. So that's all I have for you guys on minerals. A few reminders. Um, you're going to need your lab course pack for all the labs. Uh, your lecture 2 quiz is going to be due this Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Minerals lab is due at the beginning of your next lab. This week we'll be doing Earth's interior, interior for lab. And then I want to remind you again that our open lab hours or my in-person office hours are Mondays from 4 to 5.50 p.m. and Wednesdays from 4 to 5.50 p.m. And I don't have it on here, but you also have uh, a pet minerals essay assignment this week. Uh, instructions are in the assignment on Canvas, but real simple one to two page essay on a mineral of your choice that can be any of the ones from the list that I've provided. Or if there's one that's not on that list that you would like to write about, just send me a message on Canvas and uh, for approval of that topic. You'll write a little bit on the properties, the historic importance, the current uses, uh, anything else interesting about your mineral, and get that submitted online. So um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know, and that can be either Canvas, email, or in-person office hours. All right, see you guys next time.